Mrs. Wilson uh, sent an email. I believe everybody got that, saying she's out of town and will not be here. Uh, Mr. Dyer called about 30 minutes ago and said he has uh, a very bad cold and doesn't want to give it to everybody. And, I agree uh, with that. <laughs> Mr. Davenport has called and said he'll be about 15 to 20 minutes late. So uh, the Who question the that I have for you oh. is do we want to start with the uh, short-term rental in view of the fact that uh, Mr. <coughs> Davenport isn't here and Mr. Earn isn't here yet. And uh, well, do you want to go to the legislative agenda first? Well, they're both very substantive issues. <laughs> Whatever you say, Mayor. Yeah, we're with you. You choose. Okay, we'll go to the legislative agenda first. Then. Okay. Well, if you'll excuse me, I'll go get my tea. <laughs> Maybe we take a five minute break. No one ever objects to breaks. They just object to the consequences of having them. <laughs> Especially if the day goes long. Hang on, I'll get you. Okay. Aaron's coming over to do it. So. Yes, sir, she is. Welcome, Mr. Mathias. Hey, Mr. Mayor, members of council, thank you so much. Uh, we've got the draft legislative agenda here in front of you, but I want to introduce you to Aaron Torrio, uh, the new first person, uh, first contact person, and my assistant over there. She's been with the city about 14 years now, and uh, not counting today. And uh, she just started about three weeks ago, and she's doing great. She came over from waste management, and I uh, hope you all have had a chance to uh, talk to her, but she's the wonderful person when you that answers the phone when you call in. And she's also helping Nancy out with uh, concerns and complaints and things like that. Great. So the package in front of you as in years past uh, is based on input we've received from the city departments, uh, your boards and commissions, and then also the policy issues you've had in previous years. And as in years past, we've got the package to, uh, divided into two parts. Uh, your long-term positions, which are, uh, by long-term, we mean a couple years or more, and then uh, new initiatives. So the first uh, new initiative will be post-Labor Day opening. Obviously, this is, no, excuse me, the first long-term initiative is post-Labor Day opening. Uh, this is something we've had in the package since 1986 when the so-called Scooby-Doo or uh, King's Dominion bill was passed and basically trying to keep schools uh, closed until after Labor Day. Um, we have consistently lost this issue in the House of Delegates the last five or six years and only been successful in killing it in the Senate uh, Education and Health Committee. Uh, this last session was a very narrow vote, and we were told by several of the senators that voted for us that we needed to work on a compromise uh, before the 19th session of the General Assembly came around. And we're doing that as we speak, uh, but uh, we're just not quite ready to announce what compromise we're talking about. Uh, but um, I think that before the session starts, we will have a formal position for you all to uh, reconsider. And will that be a position that the school board votes on before it comes to us? <laughs> uh, hadn't thought of that, Mr. Moss, so uh, uh, it's still it. going to be a statewide position. What's happened is... Over the last several years, the number of uh, exemptions from the post-Labor Day policy have expanded so much that now about 57 percent of the students uh, can go to school before Labor Day. Uh, Fairfax County was a big hit when they were given a waiver a few years ago. And what's been happening is, um, and I'm sure the folks in Fairfax would 
argue with me is the uh, existing waiver is for weather and what Fairfax has done is anytime snow has been within 20 miles of Fairfax they've declared a school day uh, a snow day <laughs> and so they've ended up having enough uh, experience with snow days that they can now say they are uh, affected by weather uh, so they get the exemptions and it's basically just east of 95 now that is not exempted um, previously it was most of the rural localities and mountainous localities that really did have a uh, legitimate weather issue uh, but they contained although a, lum a fairly large number of school districts a fairly large number or excuse me small number of students Thank you. Um, Next item is moratorium uranium mining. Again, this is a long-term policy position, and our biggest issue right now is Virginia Uranium, which is the company that owns the deposit out towards Danville, is uh, suing in the U.S. Supreme Court, which will be taking up the issue uh, next month, uh, saying that only the federal government can control where uranium mining takes place. And so we've asked the uh, General Assembly, the Attorney General's Office, the Commonwealth generally, to be very involved with that lawsuit, uh, with friends of the court briefs, et cetera. Um, I, th I think I'm very uh, secure in saying the General Assembly will not give them approval to move forward, uh, but the, this Supreme Court case is an issue we have to keep uh, up on. Recently there was a rezoning request out there to rezone it for mining to take place and that was defeated by the local board of supervisors. And as you know through the Planning District Commission we're cooperating with the um, Roanoke River Basin uh, folks uh, now uh, financially so that we can pay part of the cost of their executive director and their main uh, goal is to maintain the status quo on uranium mining. Uh, voting rights, again, this was an issue from your package previously that uh, was supported by the Council and the Human Rights Commission. They again asked for it to be in the package again this year, uh, but basically tried to increase voter participation uh, through redistricting reform and improve the ability of folks to vote uh, with expanded voting hours, uh, things like that. Well, personally, I just, I just think it's... Uh this, how the General Assembly decided to operate their business, I don't think is our jurisdiction to do. But we might invite them to tell us to set up an independent panel to do our redistricting as well. Uh, I just think we just need to be careful. This, you know, we're basically telling another legislative body how they need to do their business as a governing body. Not, I just think, I've, I'm sure you've all heard from some delegates as well. I, this was is not well received. Uh, the next one is solution to coastal flooding, recurrent greenhouse uh, gas initiative, regional greenhouse gas initiative, again from the Human Rights Commission, um, and uh, uh, Council Member Henley has been the big patron of this in the past. Basically, this is trying to get Virginia to participate in the uh, Northeastern Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, where you, there'd be a buying and selling of pollution credits. And it's estimated that Virginia could get as much as $200 million a year uh, through this process uh, without increasing electricity rates. Uh, this came close in the last session. Uh, if it doesn't pass at 19, I feel very confident it will in 20. Uh, and this is outside of the uh, clean air initiatives at the federal government level. Uh, Governor McAuliffe set the state on a path to have our own clean air plan uh, that we can do independently, uh, and that's the way it's going. In fact, the recent Trump initiative uh, would have each state set its own uh, emissions uh, standards rather than a set of federal standards, so this is in keeping with the state's been uh, pursuing. Uh, Menhaden fishing regulation, again, uh, this is a carryover, something supported, I think, by uh, most of our delegation. In fact, uh, uh, I think all of our delegation, uh, all 13 members, have been very supportive of legislation that would have uh, the maintenance and regulation of Menhaden put into the Virginia Marine Resources Commission. Right now, Menhaden is basically the only fish resource that's not managed by them. Instead, it's managed by the General Assembly. Um, last year, last session, excuse me, 
Um, there were several bills put in the House and Senate by members of our delegation that would limit what Omega Seafood, which is they're the big uh, taker of Menhaden, uh, could take to the average take of the last 10 years, which I believe was 51 million tons, uh, and instead of what they're permitted, which is around 83 million tons, and even with putting them at what the average for the last number of years has been, they were opposed to that. So we'll have to see. And, and right now, Virginia is in violation of the uh, uh, fisheries management plan for the Atlantic Ocean, and we'll see what action is taken by that regulatory body. Well, on, on that one, so, so the plan is to try to get it removed from from the, I guess, the General Assembly and put it where all the other fishing regulations yes, are? Yes, sir. And what's, what's the likelihood of that? <laughs> uh, it's a tough, a tough one. Um, it, um, I understand Alec Knight told me he was going to put the bill back in again this year. Uh, recently, uh, at the Hampton Roads Caucus meeting last week, uh, Senator Cosgrove brought it up as something he was going to be pursuing. So uh, even if it's tilting at windmills, they, they are planning to continue to pursue the legislation. And I think, you know, it's, um, I hate to use this analogy, but it took uh, Delegate uh, O'Brien seven years to get the lottery bill passed <laughs> back in the old days. So uh, this is something that's going to take a lot of time, I think. Uh, animal cruelty, and uh, this was brought to council's attention by uh, Council Member Wood two years ago. And basically right now under Virginia law, any companion animal, you can all but kill it, and it's only a misdemeanor. And the case that came to the forefront was a dog that had been hacked up by a machete and left to die, and uh, the court could only uh, put a misdemeanor fine uh, penalty against the perpetrator did that. So uh, Senator DeStef is taking this on his own. Uh, the only reason it's not passed in the last couple years is because the General Assembly has a policy whenever you create a new offense that requires a jail sentence, you have to appropriate at least $50,000 uh, for uh, future jail costs. But uh, Senator uh, DeStef uh, thinks the third time is a charm and is going to pursue this one. So we that put, means they're going to they're fine 50000 in the Yes, budget? sir. Yes, sir. On the finance committee. <coughs> Uh, no, he had, he's he's not on finance. I thought he was. No, sir, he's not. Um, but we have Senator Wagner, and uh, Senator Wagner's been very supportive. It's just this sort of conference committee thing that comes out of the end, and they were a little strapped uh, during this last session, but I think they're going to be less strapped as it were coming up uh, in the 19th session. Uh, certificate of public need, again, a long-term uh, policy position of the council. Uh, last year, there wasn't really any meaningful legislation put in that went anywhere. Um, our delegation is uh, pretty united on this, basically protecting uh, some form of certificate of public need while creating more um, uh, innovation in the marketplace. Yeah, it's you know, I'm going to support the lecture, but the increasing analysis more and more is showing that this is actually not saving medical people money. That's, the analysis is not sustaining the rhetoric of the hospital industry. Well, with Medicare expansion, uh, it's certainly a new day for all these things. And Medicare expansion in Virginia goes into effect uh, January 1st, so I'm sure they'll have some more information on that uh, by then. Uh, Expansion of the Human Rights Act, this has been in your package for a number of years, and there's a follow-up uh, position later in the package. But basically, uh, uh, this will be the ex acceptance of the Virginia Human Rights Act or expansion to prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity. Uh, Virginia Beach um, went into this uh, probably 20 years ago. Uh, and we don't do any kind of discrimination on those grounds now. I'm not sure anybody does. There's a uh, executive order that Governor McAuliffe put into place at the state level, which was renewed by Governor Northam. Uh, but the desire is to have this passed into law so there's not uh, a change in how it's enforced from uh, governor to governor. Comment. Yes, ma'am. Does this meet... The satisfaction of those couple of human rights commissioners. The last, the the, the follow-up item in the new initiatives does. Okay. 
Thank you. At least I sure hope it does. <laughs> um, full funding for the STEP program. If you all have had for a number of years, uh, as long as I can remember, additional funding for mental health. Um, what's come about for the Human Rights Commission is they've put some specifics in place in the package. Uh, and I can't tell you how much money it's going to cost, but we'll have those numbers uh, by the time the session starts. Uh, and uh, hopefully, you know, behavior mental health, we just had an excellent meeting um, that uh, Danette Smith put on. We had the Secretary of Health and Human Services here. A number of the members were in attendance, a number of members of the General Assembly delegation. And this is a very big issue statewide. I think about 45% of uh, Sheriff Stolle's uh, guests down the end of the road here have uh, uh, mental health or drug or alcohol uh, addiction issues and if we can keep them out of the jail everyone will be saving money so you could actually spend a dollar to save ten through the step Virginia program I only have one question if it came down to type money and was obviously it's on our next page of 14 which is a higher priority do you think to the city fully funding this or using the internet sales revenue for K through 12. If we had to choose, where do we stand? Because that's the kind of choices we could be asked. It it, it is, and uh, I'm really not in a position to make that kind of recommendation right now because we don't have the full cost of the Step Virginia program. Uh, again, we hope to have that in in the near future. Before we adopt it, I would like to kind of know because some of these things are, could be trade off choices, and I think the council ought to communicate what its priority would be if we had to choose. What would we choose? Um, and the next one again is uh, uh, we're going into uh, new initiatives, and this is uh, an act naming legislation for sales tax on all internet sales. Right now, um, Amazon uh, sales are taxed in Virginia um, by Amazon, uh, and and every citizen that buys stuff all the internet is um, bound by law to pay uh, the tax on the items they buy if they're not already taxed. And uh, I'm sure we're all law-abiding individuals in here, uh, but this is a way to make sure that the sales tax is collected on all internet sales. Um, there'll probably be an exemption for businesses that do under $100,000 a year, which was done in Iowa uh, in their uh, court case that went to the Supreme Court was approved by the Supreme Court and some other uh, issues um, there's also the issue of whether for intrastate sales whether they're collected at the point of delivery or the point of sale uh, in Virginia it's kind of strange because we have a uh, out close to Lynchburg I believe uh, a very profitable very high volume furniture store that delivers furniture all over the state, but they generate an awful lot of sales tax within uh, and for that locality. And so uh, most of the places it's, it's on point of delivery, um, certainly from out of state, it's on point of delivery, but Virginia would probably use point of sale for intrastate uh, sales uh, so as to not provide a hardship to that locality. Before we move off, because we know we had the experience of the lottery money that went to education, but all it was was changed the name of the money and the money remained the same. I saw the antecedent uh, sentence that talked about maintain the current sales and use taxes. I assume that's a generic statement is that we want to this to be in addition to baseline revenues. Yes, sir. And also baseline revenues plus normal escalation on top of that. Well, we might want to look at that wording so we explicitly state what we mean because we got the, the switch on it and on the lottery and got no new money. <laughs> But they got the credit for giving the flag. Yeah, they even put it in the state constitution, although it still didn't mean any. They right. just took $400 million that was going to They may not do it, education. but I just think it got to be explicit what we mean. Um, state of Virginia Act uh, Communications Tax Update. Uh, this came from um, uh, David Bradley, um, and basically the General Assembly has been um, cutting away, slicing away, uh, whatever you want to call it, at money coming to the localities from communications taxes. Uh, we're down a substantial amount of money on a year yearly basis now, 
and that money previously went to the 911 center, which you know is a very expensive uh, center to keep up. So what we'd like to do is to have them at least go back and re-examine and make a more fair delineation. What the General Assembly did is when they took money away from localities, they gave it to the state police rather than appropriating money directly to the state police uh, so the state police could improve their 911 system. But the request here isn't to revisit the allocation of current revenue streams. The request here is to enact legislation to expand to what types of things the tax applies to. And it says phone cards, but I suspect it's probably Netflix, it's Hulu, it's all those things. So we're actually asking the General Assembly to enact an additional tax on our residents. Is that what we're asking? No, sir. We're what trying to get mean? things that were taxed that either didn't exist when the sales tax was put in place and Internet access was in place at that time, but new things that have come up since then. We get an exclusive list on how much more Because well, sure. this is requesting a tax increase. And I'm not so certain that I'm on board with that, but this is has a revenue implication. I'd like to know how much we're imposing taxes. This isn't a reallocation. This is an increase. So are, are you saying like things like a, like physical... They have to be a physical thing. Yes, ma'am, I think so. Well, like I said, just let us know. I'd like to. Uh, micro business procurement. This was in your package several years ago, uh, right after Governor Goloff was put into uh, office. And we look at this as a way to increase uh, minority and SWAM businesses. Um, uh, basically, <coughs> there's a definition for micro business, and this would allow us to have a preference for micro businesses. Uh, we, uh, we've had bills put in on this. I believe Delegate Davis was one of our champions on this. And we're just uh, trying to start again uh, with this process. Uh, next one is uh, increased ability to procure construction by best value for certain localities. That would be us. Uh, we'd probably make it localities above 400000 or above two fifty or something like that. Uh, and basically for con non-transportation contracts between 500000 and $2 million, we could do best value. Again, this would be a way to promote more uh, SWAM businesses, uh, uh, which is a big goal of the uh, city and, and the Commonwealth. If you could let us know the total dollar value and the, and the number of things we think this influences, what's the universe that falls within that, and, and, and what we think is a consequence that will allow us to move the metric on that, that would be helpful, I think, insightful. Is this, you know, $50 million worth of stuff? Is it, you know, $25 million? And we think this is what it will help us do. I'm just trying to get an idea of just what we're, the volume of opportunity we're talking about. Okay. Mayor? Yes. Mayor. Uh, Councilman Moss, um, I appreciate your support for this initiative. We had this on our legislative agenda in years past. It dropped off. Uh, <clears throat> and Steph and I had some major discussions about whether or not um, we ought to just go uh, for all contracting in general or we, we kind of crawl, walk, run into the concept. Uh, the staff convinced me, and I and I now agree with them that you begin with the SWAM-oriented uh, minority and um, and uh, women-owned business emphasis that we have been very focused on, um, and continue to make great headway as a city in in providing those opportunities for those uh, small businesses. Uh, but we think that if we can show uh, on an important aspect, you get kind of two birds with one one stone. You have an opportunity to to uh, show the value of it because it's the larger firms that have great influence, as we all know, in the General Assembly. And when you get to best value, there's there's a reluctance for some firms to understand that uh, this does require, uh, and, and and local jurisdictions are going to need to understand it does require us to provide report cards. Uh, based on performance of contractors so that that uh, catalog of performance-oriented reports are able to be leveraged into the business of evaluating them uh, for their next job. So the saying that says you interview for your next job every day, uh, your performance 
your your quality and your timeliness uh, of today's contract will affect your ability to compete in tomorrow's contract. And as a local jurisdiction, I think you all, as stewards of public money, want the best quality on a timely perspective with contractors that are reliable that do their work. And so we don't have that in the state, and it's a low-bid oriented environment. And I think the quicker we get there, the better off we're going to be as far as being able to deliver better and, and higher quality products. I appreciate your support. No, I appreciate your explanation. I look forward just to seeing what the opportunity is for the minority yes, community sir. on that. Thank you very much. Um, Taylor, Ad I'm sorry, pardon me. I'm sorry. Uh, Taylor Adams, your purchasing agent, uh, is a huge uh, asset for you all. And uh, when he first came to work for the city, we pursued this. And he made a lot of good, really good relationships then. And I think uh, now he'll be in an even better position to help explain this program. Uh, the next one is the Straining Program and Conservation Efforts License Plate. You're all familiar with the Virginia Beach License Plate. Um, this is an effort by the aquarium to create a uh, additional plate. You've got a, um, a facsimile of it there on the straining program, which costs $600,000 a year. It was very surprising to me. And we get only get about $30,000 a year from the state through the Gaming and the Fisheries Commission. Um, this will not pose, I don't believe, uh, a threat to the Virginia Beach plate because I think that goes mainly to people in Virginia Beach, whereas this conservation and rehab uh, plate would have more statewide um, uh, awareness and, and interest, I believe. So I don't think we'd be competing. Of course, it's dollar in, dollar out. Um, really doesn't make too much difference. But with a new plate, we think we could raise a substantial amount of money. Now, having said that, the current law says you have to have 450 uh, registrations before they'll make the plate. Um, I've been working with uh, Delegate Knight, and he's agreed to go ahead and send a letter in to DMV uh, saying he'll put the plate request in, and uh, we're going to try to get the uh, buy-in down to maybe 250 plates rather than 450. So next year this time, the plate could be a reality rather than waiting for the legislation to pass and uh, then start uh, doing the advertising. Uh, High-speed rail, uh, Mayor Jones has been a huge supporter, as has the entire council of higher or higher-speed rail, a technically correct answer. And um, we've been pursuing a Tier 2 EIS environmental impact statement for high, high higher-speed rail from uh, Richmond to Hampton Roads. It'd be a two-prong down the peninsula and down the south side uh, route. Uh, we've been told for years that until we finish the D.C. to Richmond, uh, EIS, which was $65 million, that they wouldn't do ours. And so that one is finished now, so we think it's our turn at the plate and that the money should come from the Commonwealth rather than taking, as they've recommended, money from existing resources like um, congestion mitigation, mitigation and air quality funds and things like that. Uh, Chesapeake Bay Watershed Implementation Plan. This is where we have to go back to the general and say, hey, we asked you to do this, and you all were very nice to do it a couple of few years ago. We need for you to undo it. Uh, back when we had uh, the Lynn Haven and Little Creek uh, uh, watersheds taken out of the Chesapeake Bay and put into the James River uh, watershed, uh, it was going to help us with the regulations as they existed at that time. Now with the Chesapeake Bay Act and more importantly the SWIFT program that HRSD is doing, uh, we need to have those watersheds put back into the Chesapeake Bay Act and it could possibly save us as much as $200 million a year if we're successful in getting the SWIFT program going and getting these watersheds uh, put back the way they were originally. It'll be a very simple bill, just section so-and-so of the Code of Virginia is repealed, which always gets everybody's attention because they want to know what that means. So, Moving on, and we're getting close to the end. Uh, the Virginia Shoreline Resiliency Fund, um, this came as a recommendation from the Green Ribbon Committee with uh, Ms. Henley's uh, recommendation. Um, the uh, Shoreline Re Resiliency Fund was established as a low-interest loan, however, they didn't put any money into it. 
Um, and so what we'd like to do is they actually fund the program uh, on a, a, a meaningful uh, funding on a recurrent basis and also allow the funds to be used for um, individual property owners to elevate their homes and otherwise mitigate the effects of sea level rise. And we also would ask the Commonwealth, which should have a capital C there, I apologize for my first error, uh, to be a sponsor with federal agencies on projects large and small. Getting the Commonwealth to be a sponsor on these projects. Uh, Virginia, Virginia and Virginia Beach and all the localities have had to go these things along on their own. The Hurricane Protection Program, uh, Virginia put zero dollars into that. The big seawall up in Richmond, they put zero dollars into that. Your annual beach nourishment that we do, there used to be a program a few years, well, 25, 30 years ago, uh, where the state would put up maybe $150,000, $300,000, but they haven't done anything like that uh, in about 25 or 30 years. So we think this is a uh, statewide issue, and the Commonwealth needs to be a leader in this. I have just two questions. I know they never appropriated any money, and I know what low in the federal programs have many different, quote unquote, low interest loans. But did this have a prescribed index that determined what the low interest loan rate is? or do you know? I can't tell you today, sir. I'm sorry. Don't have that data. Do point. we think that they weren't willing to put money into something that was a loan, that they're more inclined to put money into something that's a grant? Uh, it doesn't hurt to ask. Uh, we're, we're trying to get the General Assembly and the Commonwealth to participate in these programs. Uh, the reason why I'm right. asking because we're asking for a lot of places with money, and rightfully so for good purposes. But sometimes you can uh, not ask for money over too many things, and you ask for so much that people just say, you know, they just move on to other things. So sometimes you can lower, yeah. narrow your list and be more successful. That's I suspect I that uh, most of the localities in Hampton Roads will have an item like this in their package. And the regional package, they had something akin to this, be a local sponsor and all. That was talked about uh, last month, at the uh, or last week rather. Thank you very much. Um, Stormwater local assistance fund again. The Green Ribbon Committee with Ms. Henley. Um, this is a program that's been ongoing for a number of years. We've received about three million dollars, two point three million dollars out of it over the last number of years, and um, basically. <laughs> It's uh, used for cost-efficient, low-impact practices uh, to help us continue to make strides in reducing polluted runoff. Um, and uh, so this helps with the Chesapeake Bay Act uh, initiatives, um, helps keep our ditches uh, more free of sediment, uh, and it's just a good program out along. Uh, we're just asking that the General Assembly uh, continue to fund the program as they have in the past and up to the maximum uh, level. Does that have a definition? It does. It's uh, part of the uh, uh, reserve. Uh, when you have X amount of money left over, this comes off the top, uh, the stormwater fund. Yes, okay. yes, Thank sir. I think it's like $50 million comes off the top, and then the rest goes into the rainy day fund. Um, and this was mentioned earlier by Ms. Kane, uh, the non-discrimination in public employment and housing, and from the... Uh, Human Rights Commission and your two uh, liaisons to that, uh, Madam Kane and uh, Mr. Dyer. And um, basically, uh, there is evidence that discrimination on the base of the individual sexual, or sexual orientation or gender identity and uh, also prohibit the, the discrimination in public employment on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. So we're hitting that last uh, sentence twice. Uh, your long-term policy position, and then this new position, if council uh, adds it. And I think we had that twice here. So, uh, so we have the schedule for the uh, your consideration, and hopefully adoption of the package. Uh, there'll be a briefing today. Uh, public hearing in two weeks has been your policy. We wait two weeks, and then two weeks after that, final adoption by council. And uh, obviously, if any council members had an item they'd like to add to the package, I'll certainly make sure by Friday we get these questions that Mr. Moss and others uh, ask. 
I just I just have a question and a comment. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, when we had that legislative breakfast breakfast with the Community Services Board, yes, ma'am, I was uh, kind of impressed by one of the re, uh, in, uh, statements from one of the people about this uh, pretrial uh, unit and the apparent attempt to change the funding or to take away that funding and then at the end Sheriff uh, Stolle indicating that we needed to make sure this bill didn't pass. I, I kind of wondered about that and, and so this was contemplated as being something in our package but we decided not to. That would say that we, did, if this bill was reintroduced, we, we want to keep this unit as it is and not have it. Yes, ma'am. We, we made a decision basically to limit the size of the package and my rationale is that uh, every year we know bills are going to be put in play in to take away authority we already have, whether it be photo red, things like this. And that's why you have uh, Team Virginia Beach and our great delegation up there uh, to represent. So we'll be on top of this. We'll be ready to uh, drown in the bathtub when it gets introduced. And there's no, no support whatsoever at all in the General Assembly. Uh, it's a very pre-trial and community diversion are a tremendously successful program. Um, I want to say they cost maybe 20 bucks a day for a person to be in diversion as opposed to close to 200 when you look at the capital cost of the jail and so forth. So they're very cost effective. The Sheriff's Association uh, supports them staying in place and, and obviously the best sheriff in the Commonwealth supports it also. But you would, of course, now know that we're concerned, and if you see that there's any attempt to make this go forward, that we could then take a position. Yes, ma'am. Okay. John? I applaud keeping the package small. I always think a smaller list gets bought easier. But I want to come back to an issue I mentioned two weeks ago, not to add to this package because I think it's bigger than the city, but back to that training issue that I talked about for the maritime industry that I thought that's something that HRPDC as a region, there should be a region initiative. And then we could adopt a resolution in support of it. So it's not like it said it ought to be in our community. It's just that the region needs it. But I really, there was in the NDAA Act that was uh, passed, that's the joint bill, uh, the thing about telling the Navy to look at buying, a looking open additional shipyards. I just, I just gave examples, but up capacity. Well, capacity means you've got to have workers. And if you have trained workers, you're in a better process to be participating in that. And that's a long lead item. So I'd, I'd like to see that. I'd like to I know some members, I know Ben's on, to see is get the right wording. I'm sure if you work with Congressman Whitman and staff, they could probably help get that just right. Uh, that, and then we could then support that as a regional issue that we support versus just as Virginia Beach. Absolutely. We could reach out to uh, Bill Crow um, at the... Uh, who runs the Shipyard Association. I'm sure he's following this issue. And this is the kind of thing that your Military Economic Development Advisory Committee works on with the 1,000 military uh, members a month leaving. So many of them have good shipbuilding skills and trying to get them. And certainly uh, uh, Hunting and Ingalls, Newport News, they want to hire out, I think, 8,000 people over the coming years. This is, well, I've got to be careful not focusing on the near term but the long term issue because you can't do much to generate a thousand people tomorrow but you can do a lot about generating you know five thousand people in four years mm -hmm. and it is this an investment for the infrastructure training and how do you do that and that's why I, it's going to take some study work up front but i do think i've talked with a couple local delegates to state senators about it but i do think it best plays as from the region level that we support versus us trying to push it as just virginia beach Yes. Are, are we discussing uh, workforce development post uh, high school? Are yes. we are we focused on this would be post high school. I mean you could have an inter part of it, but if you think about it, demographically all the workforce that you have is the workforce that's alive today. <laughs> you know, for the most part. And you're not only generating but so many high school students on a period where you can look at the demographics and how many you have. So it's got to be bigger than just what you're pushing out of a high school, a high school program. You can't meet the larger numbers. So I, but once again, rather than dictating the solution, but it's also got to be both. It's got to be people retooling, like I mentioned that lady who got her degree at NC State and couldn't get the right job. She's deciding to retool her career. I think you're going to see lots of people needing to retool their, and how do you make housing most affordable is raise household income. 
and to raise household income, you have to have a higher skill set that gets you a higher labor. So, Mr. Seamanager, I think it's a little bit of both, but I think it's a lot about people that are find themselves uh, trapped in stagnant wages because the skill set. And what Dr. Cook tells us, one of our biggest thing holding us back was our lack the skill of our skilled workforce. And we're hearing that also from the maritime industry when they can't hire the people. So I think it's a little bit of both, but I think it's a if you look at the length and the terms of, you know, when the Navy was just here on the peninsula about back in July, I think it was, and I forget who spoke over there. I didn't go to the mm -hmm. event, but he talked about, hey, we're ready, but is Virginia ready, I think Absolutely. was his theme. And so Absolutely. I think it's a long-term investment. So I think it's both. I just, uh, I, I, I mentioned this because um, city managers are engaged in conversation about what's our, uh, What's our regional economic development strategy? How successful has it been, or the lack thereof, of what the regional associate is? Shannon's our representative, Miss Kane is our representative. Uh, uh, she's concerned about it. She's been very engaged in helping the private sector develop a fundraising capacity, and but uh, there, therein uh, lies the issue about that which has been. Uh, followed in the past doesn't seem to be working as we go forward and internal to the senior staff here in Virginia Beach we, we talk about economic development really being focused off at the regional level first of all uh, access and marketing always is out there it's just that's been the primary focus forever hasn't been that successful especially here in Virginia Beach Secondly, it's about an entrepreneurship and, you know, startups and that whole world as we see the emerging technology. But the third leg of this stool is really about workforce development. And it just seems to me as a manager who sees his annual budgets prepared and then 46% of that operating budget going to the division of schools, seems to me that they have a large responsibility in this business, more so even than the government side of the house, because their sole focus of delivering educated kids is to provide a workforce for a capitalist environment that we currently have. And, and so somewhere in this conversation, and I'm taking the time to just address this because it is weighing heavy. In fact, we had another teleconference today with the big seven uh, largest cities in the Hampton Roads region to discuss our commitment to regionalization and economic development and, just, and to maybe work more at the collaborative side rather than the competitive side with regards to how you go about growing our economy. And one of those things is exactly what we're talking about, Mr. Moss. And, and Ms. Kane is very much aware because we drag her to every meeting we can get her into. But the thing is, our school district has to be energized. And all the school districts have to be energized. And part of this solution of workforce development, which, which many of you know, uh, former Mayor Will Sessoms had his round table, and now uh, uh, Mayor Jones uh, attends that and, and with the business leaders. But... This is not going to move. This is not going to move in the magnitude of what you're saying. And remember, Mr. Moss, you're discussing one of the one of the many clusters of economic growth that we have opportunities here. Certainly, the largest uh, because of the, the shipyards that support the Navy and the construction of naval vessels. But, but the real reality is, growing this workforce is going to have to be a primary responsibility of our school systems u universally. And, and somewhere in there, they got to be, I'm sure they're engaged, it's what they do, but even more so than ever before. Well, to your point, before, and this is Nancy Park was on City Council, Nancy Park and I went with some school board members, Lewis may remember, I know Barbara does, we went to Troy. Matter of fact, we went to Thomas Edison High School, which was an interesting high school, where they were teaching statistical process control, fishbone analysis, how you operate numerical control machines, all this in their high school because they were feeding, like we feed the maritime industry, and they were feeding the automobile industry, and they were teaching those skill sets. A large part of that work ended up doing something different, but the Advanced Technology Center and the Lansdown program were an outgrowth of that, but also they moved algebra earlier in the period of schooling because algebra is a key piece, one, to passing the test in Newport New Shipbuilding, and also to op doing the calculus and stuff required to operate these numerical control machines and do the statistical analysis and process improvement. So I do think you're correct. The long-term part is from school to work, 
And when you leave high school, if you decide not to pursue, which I think more and more people will choose to do it differently because of the cost and the relevance of some of it, to college, they're going to want to go into the workforce. How do you meet that skill need out of school? So I agree with you. There is a, a piece. But there's also this large group of people that are out of that and are out there sitting and they have a skill, have time, but they don't have the skill that the, that the workforce is now demanding and that's a retooling. And if you see a number of people in some of these apprentice programs, the age distribution will catch you by surprise. Mm -hmm. Just have one more comment on that uh, item. Uh, Mayor Sessoms wanted to create uh, Hampton Roads as the Silicon Valley of wind energy, and we're pursuing that with the two test turbines. But the skills that you would need to build a ship or build a wind turbine are very much the same. And so there's a lot of carryover between those two industries, one a new industry. If we can fix the industry and the workforce uh, for uh, uh, wind turbine, wind development, that'll help with the shipyard development also, the shipyard uh, workforce development. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, now we'll go back to short-term rentals now that we have a couple more people here. Uh, I'll get a certificate in short-term rentals. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, two, there's a couple, there's two, or three, there's two issues that uh, have been brought to my attention by the city attorney. Uh, uh, and one of them is... Uh, when we decide decide what should be the maximum occup occupancy of the short-term rental, two per bedroom plus four citywide, and three per bedroom plus two in the overlay. And Mr. Stiles brought to my attention that the issue of uniformity would you like to comment on that, Mr. Stone? Well, I, I listed the uh, I listed short-term rentals on your closed session um, on your closed session agenda in case you wanted to talk about it in more detail. But just generally speaking, um, as we discussed last week, I think we need to be uh, mindful <clears throat> when we are uh, adopting different um, uh, limits whether it be occupancy or otherwise, we need to make sure that the zoning principles that we're relying on to reach those distinctions are set forth in the, the findings or are a matter of record uh, in order to better address any uniformity challenge that might be forthcoming. All right. And that... Uh... And, and somebody also brought to my attention that I may have misunderstood the direction provided last week and that occupancy was to be the same across the city. If, if I got that wrong, please tell me and we'll fix it. I am, uh, and I'm the one that brought it to his attention. My understanding was is that it was three plus two all over the city was where the majority of the council came down last meeting. And uh, I just want to make sure I'm correct. Or, uh, or, or where was, where were we on that? Anybody want to comment? Uh, <laughs> I think that we. I think it was specific that it was going to be greater in Sandbridge than in the rest of the city. That's how I recall it. All right. Which so I think it's a problem. <laughs> well, that's the that's the uniformity problem. Right. So, we got to build, that, we gotta that, build that, the that case for them. About, so. that's, we'll, we'll, May I ask you a question? You just you mentioned the findings, and I know that in this ordinance, this proposed ordinance that creates overlay districts, you know, we say that, um, and, and I know this has been repeated at other times, and I always was uncomfortable with it. Uh, saying that the city council finds that there are areas of the city, particularly adjacent to communities in close proximity, da da da, da in which residential dwellings and so forth have been rented. And, you know, that's a statement we've been seeing that, but like I say, I've always been com uncomfortable with it because I think we have said that, but I don't know what constitutes a finding. I don't know that we have really done anything that determined that other than that, well, it seems to be, and I don't know if that constitutes a finding. 
uh, what 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 do we have to have done to really satisfy this requirement for findings? What is that definition and so forth? Well, I believe that you are entitled to consider all of the information that has been made available to you throughout the two and a half to three years that we've been dealing with this process, or we've been talking about this issue, uh, including the, the work of the subcommittees or the, the ad hoc committee and the, the beaches and waterway work. And, and what it ultimately comes down to is whether uh, this body determines, based upon the evidence that, they, that it has heard, that that finding should be made and can properly be made. So the, the, I, it's, it's at the end of the day a, 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 a decision for this body to say, yes, we believe that is an appropriate finding, or no, we do not believe it is an appropriate finding. And then we would have to defend that if it were challenged based upon all of the evidence that has uh, been, been heard throughout the discussion of this issue. Mark, can, Go ahead. I was just going to say, um, and, and I know that everybody's dealing with this and it's a difficult issue, um, but I, I, I get the feeling that every time we start moving in a direction, you're like, no, you can't move in that direction, and then we go back to this other direction, and like, well, I'm not telling you to move in that direction either. Um, I don't feel, I don't feel like we're getting anywhere in this conversation. <laughs> I have, I have drafted the, the the only findings that I have heard mentioned by this body, and I am, and and I am. We have until the time of adoption, to add to those findings. Um, I am telling you that, you know, uniformity is something that you need to be concerned about, and if there are, if there are additional findings to be included, we should include them. That, I'm not telling you to go or not go any specific direction. I am telling you what the legal principle is, and we've drafted what we understand to be the direction of the council is on these issues. All right, Jim. And, and the uniformity thing is what what causes me the, the biggest heartburn. Uh, so I got an email, well, we all got an email from somebody at the North Beach today saying that this is what they wanted. So I sent an email to the North Beach Civic League folks that were involved in this, and their response is, no, we haven't changed our position. Our position is this, which is different than positions in other communities with respect to how they want short-term rentals to operate. And I, I guess that's where... That's where I'm having an issue. I mean, they're, for example, their their main issue is is uh, one per week. I mean, that 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 is their issue. That is their their main issue. Then they have some other other things, but but one per week is is their their main issue. Um, so which, but then I think this email referenced, well, no, we only want it to be people renting out their primary homes when they're not there, kind of thing. So so that's another step. So. That, 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 that's where I, where I have, a, have a problem with it because, you know, there, there are different tolerance, tolerances, I think, for, for th this activity in different places based on, based on the, the geometry and, and, and the landscape and all that. So I just, I, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with all of this right now because the uniformity part, while, while I understand the, the legal aspect of it and, and the uni universal <laughs> enforcement, it's, it's not all the same throughout the city. I mean... We, we have an extremely diverse city in many ways, and and neighborhoods are extraordinarily diverse. I mean, there's, you know, you regardless of anything else, Sandbridge is different than the there North End is different than, than the Resort it's Beach is different than Croatan is different than, than, than Kempsville. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with all of this. John? Well, on the topic of struggling with it, <laughs> you know, I, I thought uh, long and hard since we met last time, and, you know, we're, we're getting stuck around a lot of these issues that maybe be a moot point. I, mean, I think we really, in the beginning of the discussion for all of these issues that we're talking about, we need to talk about the enforceability aspect of it. What? The enforceability aspect of it. And this is a great example. I mean, if we're going to sit here and go, okay, well, here's what your occupancy is, what's, what's the hammer to make sure that that is what you follow through on? 
and, and if at the end of that discussion we come to the conclusion that there is no mechanism to legitimately enforce it, then we can sit here and talk about it should be five or it should be four, it should be three, it should be this for this neighborhood or that for that neighborhood, but it's, it's not material. Uh, and so that's kind of been, I think, it, to date, it, it, it's been missing in some of our discussion. I mean, because we've really gotten to the point of this is an important issue and we want to find out what the right answer is without asking if, once we get to that answer, can it, we actually, you know, impact the will of that onto the industry. So, and I, I think that's probably, on this item and, and really on, on all of them, we need to ask what is that going to be? I mean, we were sitting here talking about, you know, last week, how are we going to handle how many rentals you have and what's the time frame and was, does the week start on a Friday or does it start on a Saturday? And we're having all these great discussions for meaningful stuff. But if we don't actually have a mechanism to communicate from, you know, the person who's collecting the taxes and, and that data to see if it's being followed, it doesn't really matter what we say because you can't do anything about it after you put in the rules. Well, and can, can I follow up on what sure. he said just for a second? And I think that's important because I think the only way you're going to ha capture this information is going to be from the advertisements. I mean, when you look on Airbnb or HomeAway or something like that, that's going to say, you know, sleeps 15 or sleeps 10, and and then somebody's going to have to go back and, and do the math. They're going to have to look at every single um, ad. To, to try to figure that out, and then, but nope, you know, nobody's going to go knocking on doors and say, "Okay, I need to count people." Well, well let's go because this gets even squirrelier. So Jim's it's right. Squirrelier. So you, you go there and you take okay, the maximum is fifteen, and that's what was advertised. But according to whatever formula we came up, it should be twelve. Well, really, has there been a violation of our ordinance with until fifteen people sleep there? I mean, is a violation of the ordinance that you can't advertise? wrong <laughs> i mean the, the the violation is what actually occurs so you, there is no violation until somebody shows up with 15 people in a room that by code says you have to have 12 and or there's a complaint well uh barbara first. back to the findings question okay we've heard a lot of opinion over three years but are findings just opinions or are they facts does it have to be some kind of factual basis because i know Everybody, many people say, well, Sandbridge is different. Well, have we had factual evidence to prove that? Or is it just opinions? So what makes, what constitutes findings? Well, those findings should be conclusions of fact that have been determined to be existent by this council when it cast its vote. You have to be convinced that they are, that those are in fact facts. You are making factual findings just like a, a, a judge in a courtroom will make findings of fact and conclusions of law. And you will, uh, as we talked about last week, there's a very deferential standard that applies. But if those facts are completely without any uh, support, then they could be supplanted. Well, I just kind of say we really don't have any findings at this point. We've just got a lot of opinion. And, you know, as far as being able to prove, for example, you know, folks say the Sandbridge has always done it like this. Well, in fact, all of this started, and I've got something later I'm going to pass out to you, it all started in June of 2015, <laughs> uh, this discussion we've had, and and the because of the change in what was being rented at Sandbridge as event houses. That had not always been the fact. The fact of the rentals at Sandbridge had been historically uh, weekly rentals, weekly fake, uh, vacation family rentals. But I guess something in about the last 10 years changed that. So, you know, when we go back and we look at building permits, we look at advertisements, we look at actually what's happening, we can establish facts which dispute this opinion that we've been hearing. So I don't think we've had the opportunity to really look at facts at this point. So I don't think we really have findings. And so that just was one of the things that when I was reading that is, uh, in that ordinance, you know, um, 
when when are we going to have the opportunity? I guess if we're going to adopt this ordinance that allows uh, uh, overlay districts, uh, at some point we have to have the findings that those particular neighborhoods that are applying for an overlay district do have unique situations. So I guess that would be a part of that process. Uh, anyway, I, I just... I, I still think that we we're, we have to go step by step, and I think we're trying to do the whole ball of wax at one time, which I think is a mistake. Uh, okay, let me get uh, mm -hmm. John, then Jim, and then Jessica. Okay. Well, I have said from the beginning the reason why I wasn't in favor of conditional use permits and extending this citywide outside of Sandbridge, the fact that the General Assembly has made it a by right use, that's a fact. The fact, I think it's also a fact that if we don't play our hand right regulation, the General Assembly is going to pass the regulations for us, and then we'll, that'll be a fact too. So, but well, I that's think. That's a threat. <laughs> but I think that's true. But that's a threat. Let them do it, and then we'll, because I think they made a major mistake, which I think could and should have been. Uh, uh, could, tested, could be. I'm just saying, I'm just. I don't think we need to be threatened into doing something that's wrong. I didn't okay. say that's the case. I'm well, just saying that... I'm just not letting it stand. Thank okay, you. I understand. But we can all have our opinions. I'm just stating the speculation. Okay. That's an opinion, not a fact. But the, but the point I was getting at is one of the reasons why these conditional use permits is because we can't really enforce it. All these regulations are going to do is when something goes wrong and you didn't comply with the city, whatever those regulations are, the person who's going to know the most all about that is your insurance company. And the lawyers and the investigators they hire, and as soon as they find out that there's some city ordinance that you didn't comply with, that contributed to the result, you're going to be negligent. And just like the people with the falling down deck, someone else owns your beach house. And, and so people will pick up on the fact that where's the liability, and liability often tends to discipline behavior. So I, I think you're right, John. I don't think we're going to be able to count the time or all those things, but it will have a dampening effect because there will be other people who will be interested in enforcing it for their own financial reasons when things go ugly. But if where you don't allow it, because you don't have the conditional use permit, you just say we're not having it. If someone's operating one, it's binary. There are no rules to enforce because the activity is inherently not allowed. That's easy to enforce because it's happening and it's not permitted. And I think that's what I hear from the people over at Bay Lake Pines and other neighborhoods is, it hasn't, the technology is allowed, they don't want their neighborhoods to become commercial districts. <laughs> well, conditional use permits like Bermuda grass, <laughs> you know, you can plant that one seed, but it's that kind of thing that just keeps stretching out there and putting down on different little tap roots and just expands, and once it goes, you can't pull it back in. And I think that gets back to the enforceability point, Mr. Mayor. But I do think that we can look at these overlaps. I'm with Ben on this. I do think that there are findings they're not going to be, it takes some homework. I think we have to go back and look at the education that we got. I think we have to look at that criteria, and then we have to look at the things, look for the demographics, bring all the historical experience to bear, and all the things that took place, and then make what the, uh, the reasonable judgment, preponderance of the evidence, kind of a metric, and say we can make this distinction. It could be whether it's had parking in the street or don't have parking. Something that relates to the criteria that we were educated on. I think that can be done because I think that's what the residents in the areas that want to have them, which isn't everywhere in the city, it might mind you, uh, have them, then we can do the heavy lifting. I think that's what they're asking us to find a way between having them nowhere, which some communities have done, or Fairfax had a very unusual way of approaching it, as did Lynchburg. Neither <coughs> one of those are resort communities either. But at the same time, we don't want to do an injurious thing, and I know this doesn't sit well with everyone when I say this, but I'm going to say it again, is we also can't do an injurious nature that the underlying business model in some of these places where things are predicated on a certain practice, which may or may not be seen as historical norm, but it's the, it's the current fact, and we have to, we have to acknowledge that too. I, I, think we can, I think we can get there. We just have to look at those one at a time and build the rationale and the basis, maybe it'll take some executive sessions to do some of that, maybe something we can't do, but to get there. 
but we have to. I think that's what the people are asking us. And in the end, if we can't do it, then the choice to the public, I think, Mr. Mayor, is we can't get past the precedent of uniformity. So as a community, except for Sandbridge, which has it by right, it's all or none. Because to John's point, there isn't any reasonable way of enforcing anything once you put it in place anyway. And I think he's correct. And communities have struggled with that enforcement piece because they're not going to go knock on their doors or any of that kind of stuff. So, and, I, and before we get to Jim, did you have a comment on that? No, sir. Okay, Jim. Well, I mean, I, I appreciate what everybody's saying here, and I guess what we need to be cognizant of is regardless of whether or not we're moving forward or backwards or what have you, it's the status quo is going to stay in place until we come up with something. So we're still going to have the, the <coughs> troubled places in, in, in the neighborhoods. I mean, look, we all, we all know what bad looks like. I mean, we all know what the bad one looks like when we get the, well, not the Zyder thing, but not this one, but, you know, they're, when they got those invitations that were sent out for these, these big parties out in Sandbridge that then, then went to the north end and a mansion party is somehow an 1,800-square-foot house uh, <laughs> up at the north end. And so, so we know what bad is, but, but the issue is we got to figure out what good is. And that, that, that's, that's where we're having trouble. But if we don't do anything, nothing's going to change. It's going to stay the way it is, regardless of whether or not it's, 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 it's currently legal or not. I mean, there, there's, if, if we can't get together on this, there's no way we're going to get together on saying, well, we'll just do it with all of them until we figure it out, because I think that, that wouldn't work either. So, I mean, we, I, as much as, as painful as it is to keep coming back and, Talking about short-term rentals an hour a week, and there's nothing short about short-term rentals and in, in, in all of this is that is that we, we we're going to have to come up with something or or we're, nothing's going to change, and, and I think that's that's what we need to. You have made some headway, so Jessica. Yeah. I feel like every time we sit down and talk about this, we always go back to kind of our worst case, which in just talking with the public is these event houses. And I feel like somehow, somehow we've got all of these issues coming from these quote unquote event houses and then we're going back to short term rentals, the day to day short term rentals, the ones that are regular that probably most of us drive by and don't notice. And I wonder, is there a way to partition that out and say, let's just address the event houses first? Because I feel like that's something we all can probably get behind and have clear, concise direction and then work on the rest of the city in terms of what a regular short-term rental is going to be because, I mean, there's got, I don't understand how we can't look at these houses that have, you know, five or six plus rooms and, and go from there on th them first. I feel like that's where the majority of the problem is and when I talk to people where I'm getting my negative feedback in terms of, you know, should should they be allowed to do this? Aren't they really operating at like a bed and breakfast or a, you know, an event place, you know, can we not work on it from that angle first and then move towards trying to worry about what everybody else is doing, especially considering most of the people that are renting short term are not problems? Barbara. Well, the problem is, is there's no definition of an event house. Cool, but that's what I'm saying. Maybe know, we need to get a de definition. But uh, because this, this one that you just referred to that, you know, we had the potential party at Sandbridge, which apparently everybody thought it was okay if you did that at Sandbridge, just don't do it at the North End. I disagree. But that was a very small house. So it's not really the size of the house that constitutes the place where events are held. It's the fact that, you know, they are rented in this particular fashion. So event houses tend to come out to be a subset of, of short-term rentals. Uh, but you're right, it started with the event houses, but that is just sort of, it, it shows the evolution of all of this. As long as people were renting for family vacations, weekly fa family vacations in Sandbridge, weekly fa family vacations at the North End, everything was fine. What upset the thing was when we started having other types of rentals. And, and I think from the background, we pinpointed that as sometime around 2008. That's when Karen Lasley indicated that she was called upon to make some determination and thought it had to do with the uh, mortgage problems at that particular time. And so, da 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 da, you know, one thing after the other. And so then, 
then it got to be, well, this is so great, we will start building these really big houses and so forth. And you can look at the building permits, and I have them, and I'll be glad to let you look at them <laughs> to see the companies that were building these much bigger units that were not ever intended to be single-family residences, but that's what the building permit application said. But they were intended to be these big things that were rented out for special events, for different types of rentals than what they had been in the past. And so I think we can look and say it happened to start it. This, this needle started going in the other direction around that time. Before that, everything was fine. But then, of course, with the advent of Airbnb and these platforms, then this started happening in other neighborhoods as well. And so I think that's when the resolution was passed. I believe Rosemary and Ben had that resolution that asked that we look at Airbnb in addition to the event houses. And so it's all just kind of gone from one thing to the <clears throat> next. You can track back the minutes from June of 2015 when it was first, when I first brought it to you, to what has happened all this time. So when we say this inaction of council, yeah, it's gone on for three years longer because council didn't act. So yes, it's gotten more entrenched in that length of time because council didn't act. Um, but anyway, it, it is a much bigger thing than just the big houses because of all these things that have changed and there's no way to say. So I think it's the use. I think if we're just saying, you know, a, a rental for a family vacation is fine. And so these resolution, this, these regulations do say you can have three events a year but then of 50 people per more, goodness, 45 people can cause an awful lot of angst in a neighborhood. So, you know, that's going to be a problem. But it's this different type of rental that has caused the issue. And I don't know how you regulate that because we're, <laughs> we're really getting into a, a difficult situation if you say you can only rent it for a family vacation, but you can't rent it for a party or a wedding and that kind of thing. So that's where we are. I, th I think, though, but going to that point, I think that's where we need to be, though. Instead of trying to regulate, oh, you're a short-term rental because you're renting for X period of days, we need to be saying you're this type of rental because you're this type of use. I know that when we commercially rate insurance products, we use a stat classification, and then you're audited at the end of the year. And I'm not saying that that's what we have to do, but there are, there are ways to start from, okay, who is operating under this use, and what are our rules for this use? I, I just I think that we're going to just beat our heads onto this table talking about short-term rentals in a broad picture, and if we don't get to the root of the problem, which is people using their homes for event purposes, you we're not we're not going to I don't know that we're ever going to leave it's ever going to leave this room. I mean I, I agree I think that that there's a lack of action, but we're just I mean. Honestly, I think what Ben said earlier about being frustrated and just every time we come back here, it's like square one. I think we have to address this from a use, from, <coughs> from the, the perspective of who is using it for what and how do we regulate that use. Because I think the, the number of days is irrelevant. Janet. Uh, along those lines, um, that's why I feel the parking component is so important because I remember meeting with Molly and some of the others back I guess three years ago now it seems like a lifetime but um, it was the porta potties the loud music and could the fire trucks get up and down the roads because there's cars parked everywhere and you there's pictures of cars up on top of cars uh, going to a party and um, much to what John said about we have to make sure we can enforce whatever we put there because our police couldn't get there in time and everything was quiet when they did get there so even though we had something in place when they got there it was you know hence the the 30 minutes or the hour or whatever that the person has to be to get there but I think um, to what Jessica is saying if we work on you know the parking and the noise and those things that we know we can't control to at least make things livable until we figure the rest of it out um, you know no porta potties and you have to be able to park on the pad and I don't know those types of things that I think that are quantifiable um, and easy to enforce. Hopefully, um, if we make that step first, and we, we obviously have to keep moving, but I think checking those things off of the list to get those under control might help. 
could. Right? No. <laughs> they, uh, we tried. But no, it we didn't, keep trying. It didn't work. I mean, we had the Beaches and Waterways <laughs> recommendation. Yeah. I voted against that next committee being established, the Ad Hoc Committee, because I thought we should have acted then, but we didn't. So here we are. <clears throat> All right. Mr. City Attorney, can yes, we sir. have a different <coughs> per bedroom rule for overlay districts versus citywide? I would ref I would pref refer you back to the discussion that we had in the closed session next week. Okay. You can you can you can the, the, the general rule is Broadly stated, you must treat similarly situated properties similarly, but you can treat differently situated properties differently. And so the question becomes, what is the factual basis upon which you distinguish residency in one part or, or occupancy in one part of the city versus another part where the use is you know the same use all right would 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 the fact that an overlay district has been established be a justifiable difference yes i think so if there are findings and we don't you know and that doesn't mean opinions it means facts that would justify a place being an overlay district and i think that well, that's what you do when you have the, it goes through the planning commission and it comes to the council. Or a it? collective judgment over which reasonable people could disagree as to the reasonable answer. Or a court ruling. <laughs> a court ruling, I think, is probably... And, and I think that's where this is headed, I regardless of where this is headed for, I mean... I'm with Ben on that. We're headed for a court ruling, ruling of some degree. we do something, so... That's what, I mean, it sounds like from what I'm hearing from the city attorney, regardless of what we do, somebody's going to challenge this. Well, I yeah, came prepared. Well. May I do this? Yes. Yeah, well, let me get Jim first. And then <laughs> Three, the court the court court. Court. We might as well. I mean, let, let, let me ask this, and maybe this is, this might be going back three steps, but <laughs> if, based on, you know, just the general broad strokes of, of what of what Mark said that similarly similarly situated properties are treated similarly unless it's different and then we talked about and Barbara mentioned the findings and, and that sort of thing. Is there a um, is there a way that we could maybe actually do some sort of investigation to to look at the the various areas whether it be through a combination of public hearings, citizen groups, that sort of thing, to figure out what is different about this particular neighborhood and that neighborhood and, and that before we get too far down the road. Because here, here's the other thing I fear as we go through all this. We, you know, by, by some miracle we come up with something that we all agree on, then we go out and have the public hearings, and then it just all blows up. And you want to talk about, about sliding back three steps, it's going to be... Much worse. And I, I don't know if that's possible, Mr. Mayor. That that that, that we can do that. That we, we could we could have a series of, of public hearings in, in, in these different neighborhoods. Um, you know, have have staff work with with a group to 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 identify differences and similarities and that sort of thing. I mean, because I think otherwise, I think you're right. We we end up not fixing it, not being able to enforce it, and going to court. <clears throat> I don't know if anybody likes that idea or not. But. All right. Barbara, would you, what did you have? Well, I passed out to you the minutes from June 23rd, 2015, when I first brought forward, and it's kind of interesting, we had four members <laughs> absent that day, when I provided this letter from the Sandbridge Civic League and another letter from the Sandbridge Business Association uh, describing this problem that had developed down there with event houses and uh, seeking some relief. And it includes with that uh, some statistics that the Sandbridge Beach Business Association provided. If you notice, the uh, total number of homes in the rental pool is 45%, not uh, a majority, and so forth. 
Uh, then I also included the two pages in our current comprehensive plan, which was adopted in 2016, a year into this discussion, which says what Sandbridge is and should be. And it says it's a stable, low-density, single-family community with about 1,200 dwelling units and so forth. Many of the dwelling units have been into visitors who prefer a slower, quieter atmosphere than that experience of the oceanfront resort area. But then it acknowledges a trend of large single-family houses being used for large family or friend vacation gatherings has become an issue in recent years and could become a destabilizing influence. And so we adopted this, and it said, if we don't watch out, this destabilizing influence is going to do something to Sandbridge. But the recommendation which we adopted said, it is the policy of the city to retain the existing low-density neighborhood character of Sandbridge, and the following land use recommendations apply. And it doesn't include <coughs> what we're saying. That's what our comprehensive plan adopted in 2016 said. And then I copied this. Um, uh, no, that's the wrong. Oh, okay, something else is coming. Oh, but anyway, the uniformity uh, thing, which says all zoning regulations shall be uniform for each class or kind of buildings and uses throughout each district. And I understood that to be each zoning district, like R10, R15. So all regulations within a zoning district shall be uniform, but the regulations in one district may differ from those in other districts. It didn't say, doesn't say that within that district other places can, can have different things. So looking at that as the context of how we are here, and I think the whole thing that we got into today uh, it is with this assumption that Sandbridge is different. And that's what we came up with last week, which I think we wound up with um, um, saying what we thought we said last week, which may not be what we said. But anyway, we keep saying, well, the General Assembly has taken action. And yes, the General Assembly said that STRs are permitted use in the area that is defined and described as the Sandbridge SSD. It did not create an overlay district for Sandbridge because we don't allow overlay districts unless and until we adopt this resolution. So all the General Assembly said was that STRs are permitted use. And it went on to say, but they will follow the regulations of STRs that Virginia Beach has. So I think the General Assembly has said, whatever the regulations are that we're going to have for STRs in Virginia Beach, that's what Sandbridge should follow. So now we're taking this other leap that say, yeah, but we're going to make them different for Sandbridge. Sandbridge has not had the opportunity to go through the due process that we're about to adopt if we're going to, to allow an overlay district. And we certainly haven't had the, the due process that they should be able to uh, uh, question what their regulations are going to be. We left here last Tuesday, I think, saying, okay, Sandbridge is different, we're going to make them an overlay district, and they're going to uh, have different regulations. And that's what I think we have in our proposed packet is this third ordinance. And that's why I was prepared to address this here, because this is taking that further leap, not only just to establish short-term rentals in our ordinance and to establish a process for, for overlay districts, but another leap that, okay, Sandbridge is going to be an overlay district, and they're going to have these other regulations. And I think that's where we really get into a lot of trouble with the uniformity thing by singling out one neighborhood to treat it differently from every other neighborhood in the city. We already saw the General Assembly take one neighborhood in the entire state and treat it differently. But now we, because they did that, are saying we're going to take this same single neighborhood and treat it differently from any other neighborhood without giving them any due process. Two wrongs don't make a right. And if we do this to one neighborhood, I would think every other neighborhood in our city would be quaking in their boots because when are we going to do something like that to them? I think it's wrong, and I, I just don't think we ought to go there. If we're going to take this issue, I think we need to take it one step at a time 
and give due process completely and uniformity completely and all of the opportunities completely and treat everybody right. It's not right to treat somebody differently. That, I think, they have some guarantees uh, uh, in other places that says that they have uh, equal protection. And I think that should be practiced. Anybody want to comment on that? I just, I just don't. I don't share that logic, but that's not the place to debate that. There'll be a chance for public hearings, and the public's going to get a chance to talk at the Planning Commission. They're going to talk to us and we'll listen to the public. But, you know, one shoe does not fit all, <coughs> but I do, I do agree there has to be a basis. But, you know, but I don't know if you're looking for the gravity test, like that kind of science fact, probably not going to be there. But I do think there's collective judgment that can be sustained with both quantitative and qualitative assessments that could meet a judicial test. That's an opinion, not a fact. Yes, Ben. Um, I, I don't disagree with anything that uh, Barbara had to say in terms of they should get due process and be able to go through. The only issue is, and I, I forget who said, I think Jim said, meanwhile, um, while we're doing this, you know, the status quo is the prevailing uh, influence throughout the city, so it becomes more entrenched more the more time we let it go, and we're fighting in an even bigger battle than we are now because more people are starting to do it. And why are just, we allowing that? We've already got a date that's passed that anybody could start. Why aren't we enforcing what we have on our books now? And that the is fact a, that's that we a, that, have that's, not that's, enforced that for might three be at the crux is of this problem. issue. Is we need to. Uh, I mean, we may need to figure out a, an enforcement uh, mechanism to start. But Go ahead. Yeah. They're still allowing people to register, correct? You are correct. Yeah, so that, that and the commissioner is. It's artificial in terms of, um, you know, operating. And it's, that's the whole grandfather aspect. What Barbara's different. mentioned is we do know that except for Sandbridge, where it's a principal use that the legislature has established, that's a fact that by, by the operation of our existing ordinances, short-term rentals in any neighborhood is not permitted by existing city ordinances. <coughs> that's just a legal fact, too, and that's a legal fact, not a, an opinion. But, that's but a legal fact. But we're but registering getting, them, I, and we're collecting well, taxes. Remember what the taxes. Commissioner of Revenue said, independent of what it's a legal activity or not, people used to have to get tax stamps to sell drugs too, but they weren't legal to sell them, but they made them go and get tax stamps. So there's a, there's a distinction between the legality of the activity that you're performing and your requirement to register it for tax purposes. And that's what the Commissioner of Revenue told us, and we're in here. So if you're, I think the barber's point, if you were saying enforcing, I'm not saying this is what we're going to do, I'm just saying taking that to logical conclusion, we'd be now telling the manager to all those places that aren't in the place that the legislature has granted as a principal use, you go to all those registered places that have registered and say, you have to cease and desist. I don't think that's what I heard at this table, but that would be the logical extension, and that would be the uniformity that Mr. Siles had talked about. So I think what Ben's trying to say is, since we aren't going there, is, well, at least do something to deal with enforcement. But Barbara's mentioned at Lagomar, we have something that hasn't been in compliance with buses and everything else, and we have not been very successful in enforcing that, which seems to be a rather an obvious and acute violation of all current standards. I don't know, Ben, tell you the truth, that we can enforce anything. You know, tell you, get right down to unless we have a long time, like two years. You remember Mrs. Murdy's house? I know you know Mary Jones, what I'm talking about over in Pembroke Manor. Three years just to get a house condemned. It's, uh, oh, yeah. I don't want to give people a false expectation of what we can achieve. That was a nightmare. I know it was. That's why I mentioned it. <laughs> this is a nightmare. Correct. <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't think you can enforce anything. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm, I'm just sitting here listening to all of you and uh, thinking uh, why wouldn't it be better if you, if you want to get something in place, why wouldn't it be better to put something in place that uh, has the lower number of people in the rental and the, uh, and the requirements as far as parking and 
so forth. And then if somebody wants to come in and 50 people in a neighborhood and want to come in and ask for an overlay district that gives them more privileges or whatever, whatever you want to call it, uh, then they could do that. But in the meantime, it would all be uniform throughout the city. Why wouldn't we do that? Tell me why. Well, I'm going to surprise you by saying, yeah, <laughs> I think that should be the first step, one step at the time. <laughs> So we kind of got this proposed ordinance to define short-term rentals to pay and, and at that lower level and it's all in conformity. Now we also have this proposed ordinance to say we would have overlay districts if they follow a certain process and if we just beef up a couple of these processes. But I don't think we can go so far as to take this action against Sandbridge at this time until we at least have the process in place. I'm, but, I'm not talking know, about doing anything against Sandbridge. Well, I'm, we I'm did just, last week. I'm trying so to. Let's get that off the table. Are, are we making it then a principal use citywide? Is that what you're no. suggesting, Mr. Mayor? No. I'm just trying no, to. No, I'm no, asking no. a question. What is he saying? But, but, hold on. Let, let's listen to the, or the attorney. Well, what I interpreted from that was that you would be on board with the first of these three ordinances, but not the latter two, is what I heard. And what that would do is it would impose regulations. It would, it would allow short-term rentals in an overlay district if and when you created one. It would allow short-term rentals as a principal use in Sandbridge right now because we're required by state law to do it. And it would provide the restrictions set forth on page 4 uh, lines 139 through page 5. Page 4 of what now? It, it, of the first ordinance. <clears throat> it, would provide, it would provide what the regulations were citywide. You, you're, cre you're, you're, you're creating a conditional use everywhere outside of an overlay and outside of Sandbridge. Uh, and you're saying that everyone that exists would, would have to follow these guidelines. These are citywide guidelines. So that's the one with that grandfathering, correct? Well, we, um, Mark, can I, can I tell you what I thought that it meant? I thought that it meant that the lower level uh, that we talked about, the two per bedroom plus four, would apply to all grandfathered uses all over the city. Then uh, it would be a prohibited use everywhere throughout the city for, uh, except for uh, in the creation of new overlay districts, which would have to be applied for by the residents who live throughout that community. That's what I thought my understanding is of what and we were talking about. How is that different to me? Yeah, that's what you're saying, yeah. That, that is what you're saying. I don't think I said, okay, let, let, yeah. let me, let me, be, let me try to be as plain as I yes. can be and maybe not plain enough. Please. This first ordinance would say home sharing yes. is permitted just with registration as a principal use Everywhere in the city. Yes. Right. It would say that short-term rentals are permitted in Sandbridge because the General Assembly said so. Yes. It would say overlay districts may be created elsewhere in the city by this council pursuant to a process that, you, that this council defined and that we tried to put, and I believe <laughs> we did put, in this ordinance. Yes. And that if you, and, and that, that existing short-term rentals would be grandfathered. Yes. With a way to undo it if they were not acting properly. Yes. Correct. If they did not comply with the regulations, and then it, it, it applies regulations that are applied throughout the city anywhere that use is permitted, whether it be because it's in Sandbridge or whether it's because it's grandfathered or whether it's because it's a CUP, unless the CUP provides different conditions. The, the second and the third ordinances go ahead and create an overlay district in Sandbridge and, and impose on just a few of these, but significant ones of these, different standards, specifically occupancy and number of contracts. Got it. And the third one just gives you the map. Got it. 
Oh, if we if we do the first ordinance, just the first ordinance. just do the first ordinance, then the people can Sandbridge could come in and ask for the overlay. Correct. And then we could deal with the issue of whether or not we're going to grant other rights in Sandbridge uh, based upon the application of the people in Sandbridge. And based okay. upon the discussion and what you hear and what you determine to be appropriate findings. The, the, the practical issue, though, of course, I just want you to be aware of, is that, you know, if you do that substantially later or at a substantially different time, then there are going to be existing uses down in Sandbridge. I guess they're, I mean, even if they're grandfather, whatever, they're, they're going to be subject to those statewide regulations unless and until you, or, sorry, citywide regulations <coughs> unless and until you say something different. Question. Yes, John. So those people who registered after that date, which was midnight 30 June of 2018, those people who now have registrations would not be in compliance with this ordinance and they would have to come in and apply for a conditional use permit to continue to operate. Is that correct? Are you talking about in Sandbridge? Any, no, not Sandbridge. Where is it? North Beach or Bay Lake Pines, wherever these people, they've registered. They were grandfathered, but we set a date. Maybe we're going to change the date, but we had a date of 30 June midnight, 1 July. Right, 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 right. So people who registered after that date wouldn't be grandfathered, so their operation would no longer be in compliance, and they'd have to come in and get a conditional use permit. Now, we might not enforce why they're going through that process. That makes sense. But otherwise, they'd be in noncompliance, and we would enforce the provision of this ordinance on those properties, correct? Well, and one of the... Th yes, sir. Them. Yes, sir. All right. uh, although, if I can, if, if I may... Oh, please. Um, well, I, I don't really want to keep talking, but... Um, <laughs> One of the things in the letter that I sent to you for, for possible consideration, we went back and did some additional research, and we believe that um, you had indicated that you wanted grandfathering to run with the land unless and until uh, there was a violation of the regulations that, that you could then terminate it. If you wanted to, you could grandfather for some period of time. You could say, if you if you were doing it as of July midnight, stroke of midnight, July 1, 2018, you get to keep doing it, but you get to keep doing it for a period of, pick a time frame, after which time you then are required to come in and get the CUP or find yourself in a an overlay district. So, and that addressed, to some degree, the concern that was expressed by... I'm, I'm not remembering who said what now, but I know there was a concern expressed uh, with we were going to make CUPs limited to two years, but the grandfathering went on forever, and, you know, you said with the CUPs they were going to be administratively renewable, but if there were complaints or violations, council had to be let, let know. You know, if you gave some time for the grandfathering, you could sort of create a similar uh, fact pattern. But that would mean that all the ones that grandfathered still, sooner or later, have to come to you for a CUP. All right. Barbara. Yes. I understand that. Okay. This first ordinance, I think, sounds pretty good. Okay. It does what you said. But when we get to the second ordinance and you are creating the process for overlay districts, that's where you have different regulations for overlay districts, period, whatever they may be. And that's where we run into the um, uniformity problem. If we can't meet the test. Well, I don't know. But the way this ordinance reads, any overlay district would have these different regulations. That's where I think we run into the uniformity problem because I hear, for example, the North End doesn't want these different things, but you're saying overlay districts would have these different things. But anyway, anyone would have to petition to be an overlay district. So I would think that maybe the safest thing for us to do is to just go forward this with this first ordinance and then everything in the city is uniform. Regulations are uniform everywhere and so forth. 
And then we can work on, okay, if we were going to allow, if they're going to be overlay districts, what should they be like? Because anybody would have to petition, but I do think we need to tighten up this petition. This is where you, you, you run into this uniformity problem is because these use regulations and overlay districts are different. Yeah, well, I think you're making more of that than what it is, personally. I, but this is, I know you have to think differently, but like people can have honest differences. Well, I think we've got the legal issue of uniformity. Well, that's opinion. That's not a fact. It is. <laughs> Could we just go ahead and do the first ordinance? No, this has to go to the Planning Commission, correct? I understand. Yes. Okay, just making sure we... That's why I'm saying all these things aren't being voted on by us till they're heard by the public. And, that's my point. Uh, then we deal with the overlay uh, issue separately. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we do, we do talk in this first ordinance, we, we create the term short-term overlay district. Do you want us to take that out or do you want to leave us in? Well, see, here, here's my concern. If there's a place that could come in for an overlay district and have a debate and could ask for it, the place we're most likely to see that come from is Sandbridge. And I'm sure that there, if that is something, I'm sure they would want to have that adjudicated and in place before their next big summer season, I would think. So I think, you know, I don't have a chance, and I know you probably haven't either, but all of us, I'd like to you know, kind of hear from them that that's really true, and would this, at least understand it, would this somehow, if we didn't keep the whole process rolling, and we're not obligated to vote for it at the end, would that disadvantage some stakeholders there that we haven't heard from? That's my only, both on both sides of the issue. But they need to have a chance to do that, whereas if we do this, if we adopt what's all here, they're going to be done as a part of this process. Yes. And but I it's only it going to the Planning Commission to be heard. It can be modified before we vote at the end. That's but my point. haven't had the chance to have to go through the process of having 50 property owners come in and all of that. But that might change. But is the Planning Commission just saying should we adopt the ordinance, not that they're going to become one. They would if this is adopted the way this is presented to us. <coughs> what is? Mm -hmm. I didn't read that. Sandbridge would become the overlay district, but that's what Ordinance 3 does. No, I, I, I didn't yes, hear it that. Does. Uh, that's what Ordinance 3 does. That's, that's what, what Ordinance, ordinance 3, 3 does, yes. but that's not what the first ordinance No, my only point is, even if the Planning Commission hears it, just because it goes to the Planning Commission doesn't mean we vote and adopt it and it becomes an ordinance. That's the only point I'm making. There's a distinction between a proposal and an adoption. I'm, but... You know, I, I just like to hear from the people what does it mean to them and how that might impact them. I just think we should know that. But we'll have time to do that before we vote. We're not voting today. Is anybody heart set on having an overlay district ordinance at this time? Jim? I, I'm not comfortable moving forward this way. I, I, I want to hear more. I mean, we had, we all along we had said we were going to have public hearings and we were going to reach out to, to everybody, and and this just seems like we're short circuiting that process, and that's uh, that, that's just I just I just have a little bit of hard time about that. So I don't know where I am in terms of overlay districts and all this kind of stuff, but I don't want to just go ahead and and push something through because it's easy. I, I want to get something. I want to do it right the first time, or, or as right as we can possibly do it the first time. And I understand where Barbara's coming from on this, but I just. You, know, you can tell us to draft council policy that says this is, in, instead of the language that's in the second ordinance that, that the 50 people have to sign up and so on and so forth, you could make that a council policy that this is how we're going to go about considering future overlays. We could, we could create the title short-term overlay district as we do in the first ordinance. You could have just the regulations applicable citywide in the first ordinance, and then you could let Sandbridge or any other community that wanted to come in pursuant to your city council policy with their 50 signatures You could go hold your public hearing in the community and you could move it on from there. That, that's just an alternative Well, just I said that I had some issues with the way this is I don't think it should be just any 50 people I think it should be 50 properties that have their owners requested um, 50 people could be 50 people well 50 Property owners within the district is what it says. Or, or the owners from 50 properties, you know, because, and I think we said the reason we didn't want to do it as SSDs did because you may have 
a lot of owners for one piece of property and that was difficult so you could get you know there could be four people or six people that are owners of one property I think it should be 50 different properties and I think that, that they should be uh, notarized signatures not just any signatures because I'm hearing that for our SSDs, we don't require them to be notarized or justified. I, I want them to make sure that they are the legitimate people who own that property. And, wow. and then we can move forward. Some neighborhoods okay, so don't have 50 properties. I mean, pardon? Have, some neighborhoods don't have 50 properties within them. So. But the first ordinance uh, provides for overlay districts, right? Well, the first ordinance, the first ordinance creates a short-term overlay district, but it doesn't create an area that is within that district. In other words, it, 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 it identifies the concept, right. but it doesn't create one anywhere. Okay. Is it that author, right, Kay? It authorizes, but not establishes. Correct. And then oh, if, if 50 property owners come in and ask for an overlay district, then we can, we can consider go through the hearing process to do that. Well, that we could, as I said, what I would suggest to you is rather than putting that in an ordinance, we take those provisions, which were actually in the second ordinance, and we draft for you a city council policy, which you can adopt. It's, 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 it's not binding in the same way a, an ordinance is, but you can, you can change it or, or whatever, but it would, you know, we, would, we could modify it. However, you all as a body agreed, we, we had had that conversation before, and the direction that I understood was it was just to be 50 property owners within the district. But if you wanted to be the owners of 50 distinct residential properties within the district, I certainly can word it that way. But, but that, would, that, would, that would allow you to adopt the first ordinance or, or start it through the process without the second two, if that's the will of the body. What do you think, folks? Do you want to do that? Shannon? Adopt Ordinance 1. And, and direct the city attorney to come up with the policy as to how to uh, determine the overlay debt. I think that, that check something off of our list and we're moving in the direction of do that. I mean, as yeah. John says, the Planning Commission still has to hear it. They still have right. opportunity for people to speak about it. So I, I, I think it's I a step okay forward. That. Let me put it that way. Uh, uh, John? Uh, I'm, I'm trying to you come back to me if you would, Lewis. I'm trying to get okay. Jim? I don't think so. Jim says no. Barbara? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't I'm, so I'm, I'm maybe. Huh? You're a maybe. maybe. No. Okay. Right. Can't abstain. <laughs> Roll the dice. Well, I'm assuming dice. that what we're saying is, would we have this question on our next voting meeting, which of course gives opportunity for the public to speak or not. So we're not actually doing it at this time. We're saying that this would be. Well, we got. It's got to. It's, it's got to come to a vote. The, the item that would come time. before you would be a resolution referring an ordinance. At this point, I'm understanding just the first of these three ordinances to the Planning Commission for its recommendation and return to you. And we would have a second item, I guess, that would be just your a city council policy for your adoption. And because uh, it all, that, that policy ultimately contemplates going through the whole planning commission process after that first additional hearing you created, I don't think that would have to go to the planning commission first. You could just do that. What do you say, Barbara? I, I think that's probably a step okay. that we could take. Yes. All right. John? Well, I'm going to, in that we're not committing to vote for the ordinance that we're referring to them, and we I haven't heard the public's comment, public I want to make, but I want people listening to know what this really, what I'm, what I'm really saying. Because I have Jim's concerns, and I think way before we ever act on what the Planning Commission sends back, we need to go out, and I'm happy to go with any... I certainly will do it my own if other councilors don't well, want to join in. Plan. I mean, that's I, what we I, said I, earlier. We're I would do that. I want to go out... We're not hearing that right I now. I want to go out, and before we vote, I want to go out into North Beach, and I want to go over to Old Beach, and I want to go down to Croatan. Mm -hmm. I want just those people be able to talk to us or some assemblage of us 
and and get that and I hope they'll come out to the Planning Commission as well. But, but for I them will, to be responsive, they gotta know what to be responsive to. to I'm with you, I'm with you. I said I but I'm just saying I just want people out there listening that we're referring this to get input, but I, at least it allows us to make sure, because I am still concerned about to make sure that the people that that have a certain, and I know no one likes me how I say, some people like what I say this, a business model that works for them, that they have a chance to get into that process and act and get and get a decision one way or the other. And this will obviously give it, it'll, this will come back after the election, so we'll get to know who's here to decide that. We may have to have a whole bunch of more new discussions. And, uh, but that's what, how it will be. But I will support uh, the resolution to send it to the Planning Commission. Yeah. Um, I, I want to hear from the public. Uh, I'm not um, committing to uh, option one. However, I see this as a vehicle to moving towards hearing from the public. And so that being the case, I will uh, acquiesce to it. And that's what this just okay. would allow us to do is put this on our right. agenda for comment. Absolutely. Right. right. Jessica? Um, for okay. all the reasons, I'm good. Okay. Is it as written, or is it with a a a a uh, as written? I'm sorry. Can I some clarification okay. you're looking you know, for? It actually will have to be modified because we have identified in the um, STR district, so I'll have to take that out. So there will be tweaks and modifications. Okay. Okay. We'll bring it back to you once more before we do the referral. Prepare ordinance. it and bring it back to us. I think you captured our legislative our intent. <laughs> Next week in our workshop before the agenda the following week. Next week at the workshop before we can we, we can we can we can we can have this back and you can tell us at the workshop next week if you want it on the agenda the referral ordinance on the agenda for the following week. So, but but we're not but we're not you, you don't want me to, to do anything about um, putting a, a, uh, an expiration date on grandfathers. Those are going to run with the land uh, unless they violate the overall restrictions. Is that right? Why don't we just let it go and let the public come back and tell us what they think? <laughs> Maybe the public but, will tell us what they think. That, that wouldn't exactly. be the same as a conditional use permit. But, I mean, you said, I think you said you, you mm. had in your letter, did we want to consider it the same as conditional use permits? Did you want to put an expiration date on the grandfathered properties? And what I'm hearing, I think, is no. This is here from the public. We can do that then if we want. Okay. Yeah. All right. we, will, we will make the necessary technical tweaks for it to be standalone, but otherwise we will bring it back. We will show it to you in your Friday package this week, and you can tell us if it's good enough to we can give you a referral ordinance for your vote consideration on the 18th. I commit to anything. I think so. I just want to be clear because fine. I got it wrong it's last fine. time. It's fine. It's fine? Okay. Yeah, I mean, if you've got plenty of votes for it, it's okay. All right, John. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm okay with that. I, I, I'm i hoping that at the Planning Commission, as well as with us, that, you know, before we enact this ordinance, and, and we've got 16 different rules here, that, that we have a legitimate discussion of, you know, what is the enforceability of those? And mm -hmm. I mean, at the very least, I don't want to give the public that may be dealing with some of these issues and they think that we're going to fix it for because you said you can't do it, uh, and then turn around and they find out that we we passed a law that we can't enforce. Well, let them uh, draw it up and then we'll find out. Yep. Well, but but there's got to be that's got to be part of the discussion at the planning commission and here as well as to, I mean, how are we going to determine if we're going to say you know, one or two rentals per seven-day period. How do we how do we figure that out? I mean, if two months before it gets back to us to vote on it. So I think in that two months' time, we can have somebody figure out how each of these things will be enforced. Okay, we're out of time, folks. No, I'm not sure. You got your direction for at least drawing that up, right? Yes, sir. Every day. You say? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just think you're not going to be able to do anything about it. We will now go to liaison reports. Anybody have a liaison report? I do have comments. If that's the next thing. Okay. Um, we had our second uh, symposium uh, on sea level rise uh, a couple of weeks ago, 
And one of the speakers was Brian Van Erden from the Nature Conservancy, and his topic was the state of the forest. And it was a very good presentation, I thought, and I hope you all have had time to look at it uh, on one of the replays and so forth. But he, he talked about the role of forest in relation to um, I was there. Uh, mm -hmm. stormwater control and sea level rise. And I talked with him later, and he developed this paper uh, with my thoughts and ideas, and he backed it up with uh, his, his data. And, and if it's okay, I'll have it copied and, and give to you all. I didn't want to give you all too much tonight, but I hope you would. <laughs> in talking about the role of, of, of trees, and I kind of think as a, as a committed tree hugger, this kind of vindicates <laughs> us a little bit. But some of the things that he said about the state of the forest in Virginia Beach, I thought was so impressive. We've got, or we had, at the 2011 inventory, and I've talked with Susan French, and she said, unfortunately, it's lower than this now, but we've got almost 43,000 acres of forest cover in the city. And about 46% of that is protected in some fashion. And he actually said that we had knockout numbers. He was very impressed, and I think we should all be very impressed that we do have this wonderful uh, forest, even though it doesn't meet our goals for our, our urban tree canopy, but we, we've got a goal and we're working on it. But then we, we look at the role of the forest in stormwater control and, and with reduced runoff, and he's got all the scientific stuff about soil, per, the, the porous system of, of the roots and what that does for uh, taking the surface water out for us and the rainfall interception and what the tree canopies do. And, and the water removal and, and the very simple thing that he calls trees of being pumps and how they pump enormous volumes of water from the ground into the atmosphere in a process called evapotranspiration and how much of that water goes up into the air uh, through the tree and the tree canopy. And, and that when we look at a tree, you know, we kind of need to think of it as a solar powered, no maintenance pump that's out there working for us. And, then, then the, the storm surge protection, and you know, all we have to do is think about Haiti and the fact that you know, every time they get a, a, a hurricane and they are totally denuded in what it has done to, to their, their area because of the fact that they, they don't have trees anymore. I think we can start to have this um, new appreciation for, for our trees and that we have almost 47, 43,000 acres of forest cover in our city. But then, of course, we've got 23,000 of those acres are privately owned. And uh, last year, some of you may remember that there was a 57-acre forest that was uh, timbered right behind Lake Placid and how upset and surprised those people were, were to find out that this could occur and, um, and so forth. Uh, but it seems to me that we need to undertake a, a robust assessment of our forest, and particularly look at these that are privately owned and see if there are gaps that we might want to purchase. In talking with Susan uh, French today, uh, we have underway right now uh, a new LIDAR energy uh, analysis being done, which we're supposed to have done uh, every several years, and it's due out in a month. And that's going to give us a lot of this information that, that you know, we should have to look at the, the, the forests that we have that are privately owned and see if we might want to uh, come up with some strategies for uh, bringing some of those into a protected status. I particularly think along the, the uh, West Neck Creek, the city owns a lot of those forests, but then there are these gaps like there were in Lake Placid a lot in the Stumpy Lake area and along North Landing River. A lot of North Landing River forests are protected, thank goodness for the Nature Conservancy for doing that. Along the western shores of the Back Bay, we've got some, some gaps. Uh, but then uh, see if we might want to have some strategies to secure <coughs> funding to acquire some of these key forest land tracts for flood benefits. You know, we've not really plugged this in, but this is really a part of our green infrastructure that uh, is out there working for us right now. 
and we need to make certain that I think as a part of our <coughs> long-range uh, stormwater plan and flood control plan that we we make sure that we are pursuing the green infrastructure as a component of that uh, and that we're not losing something as as we are uh, that we need to make sure we are keeping. I would suggest that we might want to consider reestablishing the open space program as a a, a opportunity for, for preservation and reforestation, uh, and that we might want to ask the uh, Green Ribbon Committee and the Open Space Committee to to work along with Susan uh, as she gets this uh, LIDAR imagery that we can identify uh, these gaps that, that are unprotected and that we might want to, to bring into our, our green structure, green infrastructure network. I think it would be a, a pretty exciting thing uh, if we can uh, say to our people that, look, we have all these things in place because we do have these things in place. And for our city to be able to say we've got this in place and we're going to, to continue to uh, preserve it and hopefully to maybe uh, make it better uh, is certainly something that we're doing uh, for stormwater protection um, as we look at more uh, structured and engineered solutions that we will also have to continue uh, to, uh, to say. But I think when we put that value of our forest as, as um, in our stormwater uh, situation, it's, it's pretty high. And, and I think that we need to embrace it and take off with it. Ben? Um, I, I'd, I'd like to echo what Barbara said. Um, I, I went back and I wasn't able to attend, but I went back and watched. Um, and, and it was fascinating when they were talking about the uh, uh, forest acting as a, a pump, which leads me to believe that this is part of our long range uh, stormwater plan um, in terms of uh, some of these uh, lower lying areas, uh, especially. And so um, I'd like to second what Barbara said and support that and, and see if we could send this to uh, the Green Ribbon Committee and um, begin to look at uh, some ways to do that. I was there also, and uh, I thought it was an excellent presentation. And uh, just the, the mention of the fact that 40 percent of the uh, uh, water or the groundwater goes up to the trees and is released into the atmosphere. And I thought that was a rather astounding fact, to tell you the truth. I, I had no idea it would be Me that either. much. And, uh, yes, John? Well, the guy with 60 trees on his property, I know a lot about trees. And maybe I'm part of that forest. <laughs> but anyway, I want to go back to a Wall Street Journal article that was in the Wall May I just come and come, uh, finish this, this oh, sure, I'm sorry. topic? But I will say that, you know, the Hampton Rose Planning District Commission uh, has, has established a committee, regional committee, to look at the stormwater issues. I think it's going to be officially called the Coastal Resilience Committee. And we did have the first meeting last week. And, and the, the neat thing, in addition to meeting with uh, other localities and talking about working together on this, is that representatives from both Senator Kane and Senator Warner's offices were present, which I think signals that the federal folks are aware of this. It would have been nice to have some state people participating, but maybe they'll come. And that, you know, when we're looking at money, because we certainly can't do this all ourselves locally, that that was a good sign. And the next uh, presentation in this series is tomorrow morning. It will be at the Senior Resource Center at 1030, and the speakers will be Karen Forget and Louis Culliford. If y'all remember Lewis, before he became agricultural director, he was a soil scientist with the Soil Conservation Service. He knows soils, and he's going to talk about soil types, and Karen is going to talk about what people can do individually on their properties. And planting a tree, especially a ball of cypress in the right place, would be one of those things. So that's tomorrow morning at 1030, and you would get to see the Senior Resource Center, which is a great resource for the city, and we will have a covered dish lunch so you can come and eat. So I hope something will tomorrow morning. Okay, thank you. John, did you have something? Yeah, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal last week. It was based on a group out of New York nonprofit that does the impact of sea level rise on property value. Some of you may have seen that. It mentioned a number mm -hmm. of cities that had lost over $7.7 .7 billion in property assessments to sea level rise. 
But what got got my attention, I know I think I mentioned it here last, but a number of the folks that live in Windsor Wood and Prince Sam Plaza are getting these uh, flood thing notices, and I think I mentioned that the condition of getting these FEMA grants, they also then got to get the insurance, and they're seeing 5400 3800 you know, you name it, it's in the multiple thousands of dollars of, of these FEMA flood insurance things, which they're required to get if they took a FEMA grant. And these are people that are already hard-pressed just to do what they're doing. So I would like to have the city real estate assessor come and tell us how his methodology is going to take into consideration now in these areas the when you start saying, here's my house insurance is a 1200 bucks, but my flood insurance that I'm forced to now get is 5400 that has a material impact on anyone that goes those houses. And I realize that people that aren't supposed to disclose, but believe me, insurance companies are going to be asking a lot of questions because I'm sure they're tracking that liability. That I would like to hear from the real estate assessor how going forward into next year's book, he's going to take that into account. And I know I talked to some people that were at the uh, New Jerusalem God, Christ, God in Christ Church were doing their school event on Monday, but there were the people that were there from MedCert and the other people who got to talk about how they've been helping, still helping people in their homes that are in, that aren't yet abandoned. But I think we need to come back and take a look at what has been the consequence and how are those neighborhoods and how is the city responding from a real estate assessor point of view, What's the outreach that's still there? Because they're just going to the neighborhoods myself, talking to folks, firefighters I've met out there in their homes. There's, as much as we talk about short-term rentals, there's another microcosm going on out there that we really need to pay attention to because I think we have not yet, that we dealt with the superficial, not superficial, but the thing about trying to improve the drainage, but the after effect and what the market conditions and their assessments of those neighborhoods is a, an impact we really haven't assessed and talked about, and I think that we should. Jessica. On that same point, Dave, I was going to ask you, would it be possible for Erin, um, I know she's got the data about what properties were categorized after this past storm and severe repetitive loss. I know from the private side of that, we can't, insurance agents can't even go and look up where that is, what properties are in the severe repetitive loss program. Um, only the current homeowner can find out. And even if you purchase a house, you don't find out until after the sale of the home is complete in order to get that information, unlike other claims history, which an insurance company could go to a, a, a broader company like LexisNexis and, and purchase that information. I'd like to know if Aaron could provide us with the statistics of the houses that, since Hurricane Matthew, have entered into the repetitive loss program. I know she can't tell us which specific houses those are, but in, and in addition to that, if it would be possible for us to see, like, some kind of infograph that shows us where they are mainly located. Just, I mean, I don't know how much think, of that I we're allowed we saw, to know. I think we saw uh, one of the briefings, I recall, there was a map that showed um, kind of the homes that were flooded, and they were all in, and I'm just trying to recall off memory, they were all generally in kind of what would be considered wetland-type areas now, and so that I think there is a map that kind of shows... Well, to be di dictated severe repetitive loss, you have to be two or more losses where you pay, mm -hmm. were paid from FEMA via grant or from a flood insurance claim. Right, right, right from, like so, Windsor? Water yeah, in yeah I mean, I, I know we can probably assume where the they are, but I'd be interested in knowing that information. And then unrelated, I, w I had a question about, I had a public works employee come to me about their um, their uh, locker room has no AC in it currently, and I wanted to know if we could just be briefed on the status of that by our next meeting. Sure. Thank you. John, our... Uh, just real quickly, Mr. Mayor, uh, a couple weeks ago we had uh, Surfer's Healing, which is that... Uh, surf camp for autistic children, uh, which has really grown over the years. It, uh, they actually hosted 470 autistic children uh, for that event. Uh, it's all privately raised, but they, uh, they're very complimentary of our Beach Works folks, and so that they did a real nice job in terms of providing some of the support for that. I've asked Amanda to send out a video to everybody uh, for the camp, but it's really, I remember the first one I saw, I was so really amazed. It took uh, three grown men to tackle this young boy uh, to put his uh, life jacket on and take him surfing and he was just so upset uh, but the uh, 
the ironic thing is it took five grown men to tackle him and get the uh, life preserver off because he didn't want to stop. <laughs> All right, so it's, uh, they, they, do a, they do a great job. I'm sorry, Barbara, what? I thought it's going to take five to get you in there. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but anyway, I'll, I'll send that out. If you, if you have a few minutes, I think it's uh, worth a watch. Thank you. Great. All right, let's go to the agenda review if we can. Okay. Um, there's no planning items, so under ordinances, resolutions, anybody have an issue with any of these? We do have the same speaker on item 2B, 2C, item 6, and item 7. For those we would hear. 2B, 2C. 2B, 2C, 6, and 7. Everything else okay? Yes, sir. All right. Great job, Mr. Boyce. Mr. Boyce. All right. Mr. Boyce, you typically vote no on the ARPs? Yes. Oh, that is true. I had it down. I had it no in my book, but I had to borrow this. Yes, I will be voting no on that ORP. I am glad you Which one is that? I didn't mark this book. Item number four. I left, this, four. left my book at home and had to borrow this from the city clerk. Which one you voted no on? Four. Uh, four. No. I hope so. But it was an easy one. It wasn't quite so huge as the other issue. Okay. Uh, they, they, I was out in public and they just approached <coughs> I went off and left it at home. So you took the pass my article. There it is. Oh, good. I went and looked up the study. I have a lot of studies on flooding. Oh, good. Thank you, Mark. Good scientific work. I'm surprised. The chair will entertain a motion to recess into a closed session pursuant to the exemption from open meetings allowed by Section 2.2-3711. A Code of Virginia is amended for the following purposes legal matters, consultation with legal counsel, and briefings by staff members or con consultants pertaining to actual or probable litigation where such consultation or briefing in an open meeting would adversely affect the negotiating or litigating posture of the public body in consultation with legal counsel employed or retained by a public body regarding specific legal matters acquiring the provision of legal advice by such counsel pursuant to section 2.2-3711A7. Legal issues involving social media, a state of India, Kager versus Fiera et al. Short-term rentals, personnel matters, discussion, consideration, or interviews, of prospective candidates for employment, assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion, salaries, disciplining, or resignation of specific public officers, appointees, or employees of any public body pursuant to Section 2.2-3711A1, council appointments, council boards, commissions, committees, authorities, agencies and appointees. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Motion has been made and second. Clerk, call the roll. Ms. Henley? Aye. Mr. Moss? Aye. Mr. Davenport? Aye. Mr. Sabbath? Aye. Mr. Kane? Aye. Mr. Hearn? Aye. Mr. 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 Aye. Mr